Ian, we're going to be covering the Paradise Papers on this episode of the podcast. I just wonder, could you give us a brief explanation before we begin? Yes, I mean, it's fairly simple. Um, The Paradise Papers are an enormous uh, um, cache of documents that have um, come into um, uh, the public domain. And, uh, I mean, they're about... um, uh, uh, I, I, I think you should talk to Richard Brooks... Page 94, The Private Eye Podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of Page 94, The Private Eye Podcast. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and today we are going to be talking to The Private Eye's tax experts, Richard Brooks and Christian Eriksson, about the Paradise Papers, the enormous cache of private documents from a secretive law firm which has been helping all kinds of millionaires and indeed squillionaires the world over to avoid paying tax in their country of residence. We'll also be talking to one of Private Eye's best established cartoonists, Griselda, about her methods of working, the questions people always ask her, and why she hates drawing. But first, it's now been a couple of weeks since the world's news outlets all covered the Paradise Papers, which is the enormous stack of information about how the world's ultra-rich and the world's rich hide their money offshore. I sat down with privatised resident tax experts Richard Brooks and Christian Eriksson, and given that it's only been two years since the Panama Papers were released, I started off by asking Richard what exactly has changed this time round. There isn't really that much new. Uh, There are lots of new examples, but um, in the acres of coverage, really, what we're seeing is the offshore world still at it. So that's not incredibly encouraging based on the acres of coverage last time, is it? Uh, No, this this information (laughs) goes back a number of years and it goes up to uh, sort of towards the end of 2015. So you could say, well, all these great changes that governments have made to clamp down on tax havens have yet to kick in. But sadly, the truth is probably that they haven't actually made that many changes. Even our own government? Uh, Yeah, even our own government. Our government has talked a pretty good game. Uh, David Cameron really talked a good game after the Panama Papers, and he promised to open up uh, the, the world of offshore secrecy, to break down the walls of secrecy. And it hasn't really happened. There have been some tinkering, but uh, the big fortresses of tax havens uh, all over the world still exist. And th- th- I seem to remember the last time we spoke about this, we spoke about the idea that we should set up a register whereby you know who controls every uh, offshore company or every offshore pot of cash. That hasn't happened, has it? That hasn't happened. What the government has done is brought in a register of who owns British companies. Okay. Though we found that there are 100,000 companies that aren't following those rules at all and nobody's policing them, but that's another story. (laughs) I mean, that sounds like a pretty big story. Yeah, it is quite a big story, but it's, uh, yeah, I I mean, it's not the one this week. There have been no moves to open up Britain's overseas territories, the tax havens. So you can set up a company in Bermuda or Cayman Islands and you still don't have to declare uh, who owns it. So, as far as we can tell, the, the, these, this is just many more examples of the offshore world going about its murky business. There have been a lot of stories with kind of, you know, celebrity focuses, people like uh, Bono or, or the cast of Mrs. Brown's Boys or the Queen, not forgetting her. Yeah. Christian, we were talking before we started this recording about the, the jet thing. Yes, well, what we've learned from this leak is that uh, Appleby have been providing a um, a VAT um, avoidance uh, scheme in partnership with um, Ernst & Young. Um, and just for listeners who may not be familiar, who are Appleby? So the Paradise Papers are uh, a leak of internal documents of Appleby, uh, one of the sort of, uh, so-called magic circle law firms, which provide uh, services to uh, the world's super wealthy from various offshore secrecy havens or tax havens. We've learnt that one of these tax avoidance schemes, sh- should I say, uh, is uh, selling VAT avoidance on the purchase uh, of jets, uh, private jets, which are imported into the uh, UK and meant to be used predominantly for business use. But as we've seen, lots of these jets um, are also being used by celebrities for predominantly personal use as well. Um, now, there's uh, there's also a whole host of, as well as the usual celebrities that are behind this, there's a whole host of 
Russian oligarchs and oligarchs from the former Soviet states who have rather questionable fortunes um, that Appleby and other of their business partners have been, shall we say, reluctant to really question and kind of dig down into the source of that wealth. So let's indulge in the momentary you know, fantasy that we are three extremely, extremely wealthy people and we want to conceal the money. Can you just talk me through exactly how the three of us are going to do it? Right. We we have some uh, ill-gotten gains, do we? Yeah. We let's say we. Yeah. How, what's a reasonable figure for you? For all uh, of us. For the three. For, let's let's about, pool our resources. Uh, hundred grand. Hundred grand. Come on, we can do better. This is a completely imaginary fantasy. We can make ourselves as wealthy as we like. Twenty. Mi- we've got twenty million pounds that we need to salt away somewhere. What's mm. the first step? The three of us take. Well, the first step is we go to a law firm like mm-hmm. Appleby. And we say we have this money. How can we... Well, we don't use the word hide. No. We say, where can we place it securely and confidentially? And then we start talking about the kind of structures that we might use. We'd probably start off with a company somewhere like British Virgin Islands. That would be a good place because they're very secret. Okay. And that would be our company. But we'd make sure that we didn't own it directly because that then puts us only one step away from the money. We want to be several steps away from the money okay. so that law enforcers and anybody else and ex-wives and all those kind of people can't find us. Uh, so we then make sure that company is owned perhaps by another company, maybe somewhere like Belize or somewhere like that. And then that company will be owned by a trust, which will have trustees who are nominees for another company and so on it will go on and on and on and you'll 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 have layers and layers between you and the money so who is running these other companies do i do i need to find my friend and then say look would you mind running this company for me i'll, I'll bung you a bit of cash but not very much is that how it works uh no they're, 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 a lot. they're my friend they're you know no. then they're also oh involved. they'll be your friend yeah yeah <laughs> but there are people who who will do this there are lots of people or enough people on these islands and other places to act as shadow directors as stooge directors okay effectively to play the role of running the company when we all know what's really happening they're not really running the company no it's but it's a big pot of buried treasure rather than a company yeah so Appleby will find those people for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, we don't need to be involved in that personally. Great. So I've got this set up. I've contacted Appleby. I've, we've, we've arranged for the three of us, these shell companies run through a trust. We don't, do we run the trust? Uh, no, we get trustees to do we that. Trustees us, to do that. Professional trustees. Yeah. So the professional trustees, stooge directors. Yeah, we may tell those trustees the kind of things we'd like to be done with the money. Sure. Not that we'd decide. Yeah, because th- that would get it too close to us for tax reasons. Uh, but but we give them an idea that perhaps they might think that uh, spending some of the money on our daughter's school fees would be a good idea, right, for I example. See. OK, yeah, well, this is the next question, is if we've now salted this money away several layers away from us, how do we get it back to us? It doesn't seem incredibly convenient if it's been locked up in all these different structures. But you're saying there's a very easy way to just get it back. There, there are quite a few ways. You can get the, the companies and the trusts that you've set up to pay your expenses for you, to buy your yacht for you, or to buy the yacht and rent it to you. Or you can get these, these trusts to lend you the money rather than give you the money. Okay, which presumably um, is even better. Yeah, it's, it's more tax efficient, as we like to say, offshore. Well, we seem to be in a pretty strong position at the moment, I'd say. Yeah, you're doing well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and no one's found out No one's found out yet. So as long as nobody else leaks a massive cash of these papers, then the money will remain secret for as long as we need it. Yeah, and what's to stop you doing it? Perhaps now the only thing to stop you doing it is the fear that there will be a leak. I do like the way that I've been saying us, trying to impl- implicate all three of us in this, and you're very determinately saying you, Richard. Yeah. Um, well, I see, you, I see, see myself as your counsellor in this matter. <laughs> so this deals with just one firm. And the Panama Papers dealed with, was it Mossack Fonseca? Yes. Uh, 
the Panama Papers dealt with just one firm, Mossack Fonseca. Compared to Appleby, they were a registered um, service provider. They provided uh, a, a range of corporate services for um, for these kinds of activities that we've been talking about. Appleby, by contrast, they are a law firm and they provide a whole raft of different facilities, which are perhaps more complex than the uh, facilities provided by Mossack Fonseca. But in both cases, you know, add them both together, and there's been an enormous amount of coverage and a lot of stories coming out of this, we are dealing with just the records of two firms. Yes, and within these leaks, there's also uh, the corporate registries of a, a number of countries. OK, but presumably these were not the only two firms who offer these structures or these arrangements to various wealthy people. There, there must be a lot of companies who are doing this. Oh, there's a whole ecosystem of offshore professional enablers who are all too happy to take a fat fee from those with even fatter bank balances um, to hide their wealth from tax authorities or police authorities or even aggrieved uh, wives. (laughs) So what we're saying is basically we've discovered two new species, but we're effectively on the banks of the Amazon and there are quite a lot of other species out there that we don't know about. Yeah, we know that uh, what we have with Appleby is what's considered the more respectable end of the market. They're dealing with the big clients, they're dealing with the banks, the big wealth managers, as they're called. And with Mossack Fonseca, we saw the slightly grubbier end of the market. So I guess we return to the question of how we discover all the other species. Is it only through asking British overseas territories to cough up their records? If you want to end this, if you want the system to change so that we're not just waiting every couple of years to get a big leak of information, you need to open up every territory. You need to say that companies established in these places can't do business elsewhere in the world unless those places are completely transparent. We're a long way from that because they naturally resist that change quite vehemently. The major countries that support these territories, in particular Britain, don't seem keen on doing that. They see financial services, which means tax haven services, as the future for their overseas territories, as the way that they achieve economic independence. And that's the big political dilemma. This is perhaps a naive way of looking at it, but it doesn't seem like it would be enormously expensive to the British state to close these things down. Is that incorrect? Not not only would it not be expensive, it would actually pay. The kind of economic support packages you would have to give to our overseas territories if you asked them to stop providing financial services would be far less expensive than the money that they currently rip off everybody else in tax avoidance. So it would be cost effective to move them away from being tax havens. But the idea presumably is that if these are not being stored in, at the very least, British overseas territories, they'll be stored in someone else's overseas territories. And so we may as well take the small amount and lose the large amount of tax rather than close them down and then presumably and still not lose the and tax. still lose the tax <laughs> yeah. without even well, the tiny payoff of the brass plate. That is the true, but that is that that is the sort of council of despair. Let's not do anything <laughs> uh, approach, which I'd come to expect of someone with the kind of <laughs> offshore accounts you now have, Andy. But you have to start somewhere, and you know you're right. I think what you're getting at is you would need major international cooperation. Britain couldn't do this alone, but Britain yeah. is a major, major player in it. It could lead the effort. And it doesn't really want to do that at the moment. I just come back to the question, why not? Why doesn't it want to do this? You know, you can see that a lot of people have a lot of money tied up in these tax havens. I I think the interesting thing about the story with the Queen was not that she shouldn't have done this or her advisors shouldn't have done this. It was that everybody does it. Everybody's money somehow is going offshore. All pension schemes end up with a chunk of money offshore I would be very surprised, for example, if Private Eye's pension scheme doesn't have money ending up offshore somehow. Of course it will. Every pension scheme does. Uh, So that's the the interesting thing about the Queen's story is that how far this goes, that tax havens are so well established in the fabric of the economic system that it's going to take some extrication. It just feels like the sort of thing that could be done, though. I mean, it doesn't seem... It doesn't seem like an impossibility. It just seems like, the, is the political will not there? Is it, as you say, it's just that everyone's money is in this. So 
everyone kind of benefits a bit, even though really everyone loses out. Yeah, all, all the banks love it, and they're tremendously powerful. In Britain, they're getting even more powerful post-Brexit. Oh, I can't imagine this government doing anything to upset the banks even more. And, of course, they, they absolutely love tax havens, not just for the accounts that they provide for their clients, but for the legal structures that they allow them to create uh, to avoid regulations and avoid taxes. So the whole financial establishment is very tied up in, in the offshore world. So another thing that we're dealing with, and that the three of us have spoken about before on this podcast, <laughs> is the property angle. Yes. Uh, yet again, this leak has shown that overseas politicians, um, oligarchs and some of the people on the more dubious end of the business spectrum are using offshore companies to purchase uh, property, high value property, mostly in London. Like we're talking about West London here, Kensington, Belgravia. So we found that somebody called Sheikh Rashid al Nwaymi. Uh, who's the son of the ruler of Ajman, one of the seven United Arab Emirates. He owns a large stucco-fronted townhouse in Belgravia, in West London, as well as various apartments within that. Of course, he he owns that via a series of off- offshore companies, in this case in Jersey. He's rather an interesting character as well. He's a bit of a playboy, in fact. If you go on his Instagram account, you'll see that there's various photos of him beside expensive sports cars and him sunning himself in Santorini, <laughs> sightseeing in Capri. So he's obviously, he's obviously busy, busy at work with various diplomatic duties. There. Okay. <laughs> so how does he benefit from the ownership through the, through the shells and through the trust? I was about to say Kui Bono, but actually Bono is an entirely separate person in this story, so we don't have to worry about him. But is it that he avoids the tax that he might have to otherwise pay? Well, it's it's unclear from the records that we've seen exactly what benefit he's drawing from owning these properties via offshore companies. Um, he's certainly drawing some kind of income from that. Um, Appleby's internal database notes that his source of wealth is through trading and development of real estate globally. So this this property here is probably just one of a number of developments um, he has. And obviously that's just one of a vast number of properties which you have both studied and in fact you have mapped around the UK properties which are owned through uh, offshore trusts and offshore shell companies. It's probably also worth mentioning about this promised register of beneficial ownership of foreign companies which uh, own property in the UK. That was a big plank of David Cameron's uh, anti-corruption drive a few years ago. But then Brexit happened and that all of the impetus of that has seemingly fallen by the wayside. Now, this register is meant to be implemented soon. But even once it is implemented, um, the overseas territories, companies in those jurisdictions are effectively going to be uh, exempt from this register because they're deemed to be compliant for transparency purposes. The consultation there has explicitly suggested that as long as there's an adequate law enforcement register of who owns the, uh, the companies there, available only to police officers on that island, then that doesn't have to be made public. I mean, that doesn't seem to follow the spirit of the thing at all, does it? Suddenly that's compliant. That, that's exactly how these overseas territories are being let off. The answer is that if they provide information to law enforcers, they'll be considered transparent. But, uh, but, but of course there aren't any... Well, no, and our law enforcers, as long as our law enforcers ask the right questions. You know, so, so if you say, can you tell me who owns Andrew Hunter Murray Limited yeah. on the BVI, they'll have to say it's owned by Andrew Hunter Murray. Okay. But, of course, they'll only know uh, the odd case of corruption. And there aren't really any law enforcers. This is the big problem. There aren't any even in the UK to speak of, never mind on these um, you know, little islands in Wait, the middle of nowhere. That's, that sounds significant. What do you mean there aren't any in the UK? There are very few people working on tackling money laundering, for example, and other financial crime. In the UK, there are a few staff at HM Revenue and Customs, a few in the City of London Police and other agencies. But against the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of dodgy companies 
that are located either in the UK that we've written a lot about in the eye uh, or in the overseas territories in the tax havens around the world you know that effort is entirely inadequate and I think that you have written in the eye that the numbers have been cut substantially not only by David Cameron's government but also they're going to be cut even further now there have been cuts at HMRC and other financial crime investigators uh, going back uh, 10 or 15 years now. Austerity made it worse, and there's no sign that these places are going to get any more money. Another thing that's been covered in the eye is the involvement of, as they're known, the big four, the big four accountancy firms, mm. whose job is often to you know, monitor the financial health of other institutions. Yeah. Well, they are all over this, um, and they haven't really been given as much exposure as they should have been so far. Any of the, the big schemes that you read about, or most of them anyway, have one of the big four accountants behind them. All the VAT dodges through the Isle of Man, where Lewis Hamilton and various other people have been uh, escaping their, their VAT bills, they were dreamt up by the big four accountancy firm EY, which is what Ernst & Young is now known as. Similarly, some of the property schemes that Christians talked about, they also have big four tax advisors behind them. And then there are a whole raft of multinational corporate tax avoidance schemes that the big four are orchestrating. But these are the most powerful financial firms in the world, probably. And that's a really interesting thing that we haven't really touched on yet, is who comes up with these schemes, as you call them. I mean, it seems like I go to a law firm or I go to Mossack Fonseca and they implement an existing scheme, is that right? But the actual roadmap to doing it might have been come up with by one of the big four accountancy firms. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think there are a number of routes in. That's one of the routes in. Another is to go directly to these accountancy firms who then right. approach Appleby to set up the necessary companies and all the, the legal contracts. But the brains behind the tax scheming, finding the loopholes and exploiting them, are in the offices of the big four accountancy firms. And obviously the big four accountancy firms, as the I has written before, are right at the heart of government in lots of ways. They you know, they second staff sometimes yeah. over to government departments. Well, they second staff into the departments that then draw up the rules that they then go back and exploit. EY even has a department that it uh, it describes as within its own offices as policy development. And it boasts how instead of dreaming up a bespoke scheme for your company, it, it will work out what law would suit you, go to the Treasury and arrange for the law to be rewritten in a way that will suit you. It's called policy development. And that's the same firm that's creating VAT scams for Lewis Hamilton and chums. Just on a personal note, do you guys ever despair at having to tell the same story over and over again? I slightly despair. I, slightly, I despair a little bit when I see the same story written in other papers and become a big story. I see sure. this massive <laughs> global story uh, and think it's, it's become a story because it's a story now. We'd written the same kind of things. I'm sorry to brag a bit about it, but six years before and no one had taken any notice. Whereas now, you know, we have the news at 10 leading on it. Yeah. But that's life. That's life. Yeah. There's more and more evidence now of the kind of wrongdoing that the eye has writ written about over the years. And now that that's really been kicked up into the public imagination through a series of super, super leaks, that can only be a good thing, in my opinion. OK, well, I'm going to shut down Andrew Hunter Murray, British Virgin Islands, immediately on the strength of this conversation. You never know. You could be in the next one. <laughs> Richard Brooks and Christian Eriksson there. And um, for the avoidance of doubt, there is no need for the tax man to look anywhere, especially not offshore and especially not the British Virgin Islands. <clears throat> All right. Now we go on to our occasional series of Meet the Cartoonist. And this week we have been lucky enough to have a chat with Griselda. Griselda is one of the eye's best known cartoonists. Every fortnight, her observations about life, the universe and everything are in private eye in some form or another. And we had a bit of a talk about exactly how she works and what the point of it all is. Here she is. As uh, Clive Goddard once said, it's... Uh... It's uh, real life in cartoon format. So they're just real people, and real people yeah. are miserable, I suppose. But not all the time, but when they encounter <laughs> a political situation or a social phenomena. Looking at one of your cartoons, which is these two people sitting in an assisted dying clinic. 
I was saying to the <laughs> That's husband. going back a bit. Do they have to wear that uniform? Yes. And they're wearing Grim Reaper outfits yes. at, behind the front desk on the clinic. Yes. There's a, there's a lot of that kind of feel. <laughs> a death lurking in every cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a, a particular way of drawing people? Because I think some cartoonists have a... <laughs> A very distinctive, you know, you look at Martin Honey sets and they're all, you know, they've got hair sprouting from their ears and they're yeah. all wearing these perpetual scowls. Is the, do you have a particular kind of person who you draw? Well, if you look at them closely, you realise that they all look exactly the same. There's about four <laughs> stock characters, two female, two male, and then some have beards, some have long hair, short hair. But, the, 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 yeah, there's no... I don't go around looking at people and seeing what they're wearing and drawing them properly like Heath or Martin Honeyset does. I, th- I think the difference is that they love drawing and can draw yeah. and are very good at drawing and, and enjoy that bit of the... Or did, sadly, uh, Martin Honeyset's no, no longer with us. But um, ironically, I don't, so... Wow. Wh- which is the bit you love? The, the bit where I go through my cartoon notebooks and, and look at all the doodles... And then pull out jokes and think, oh, look, in this sea of images, I think, oh, that, if I just move that into there and add a cat, that'll be really funny. And I, I draw a circle around that. That's the best bit, drawing a circle around the, the little doodle and thinking, yes, later in, I'll have to draw that up. Yeah, not so keen on that I bit. See. <laughs> As a cartoonist, is there a question that you get asked constantly? And if so, what is it? Oh, uh, yeah, it's how do you do it? I don't know how you do it. How do you do that? I, I don't know how brain surgeons do brain surgery. <laughs> Sorry, not that there's an equivalent. Uh, but there isn't really anything else I can do. That's quite a common answer, I think, that cartoonists give, is that, you know, they, they kind of fell into it one way or another and, and they, get the, they get used to it. They really like the way that they work, the way that a cartoonist works, which seems to be very frustrating from the outside because you'll draw, you know, a dozen or 20 cartoons and then one of them will be published, and that is a success. Fortunately, I have a slightly better hit rate than that, surprisingly. Also, I didn't fall into it. I was on a, a one-woman mission from about the age of 14. So, But also, I've, I've had um, a proper job. Uh, I worked at, um, at a university, the Slade School of Art, for 10 years part-time, and um, it was great, loved it, and did cartoons the rest of the time, and then left once I was earning enough money from cartoons. But because I've done a proper job, I know what happened. If I don't get up in the morning <laughs> and think up jokes, I would eventually have to get another proper job. And the, the technology has moved on somewhat. The, the one-woman mission thing is interesting. So what, yes. what was it that made you want to do it in the first place? Oh, well, I, had a, I had a list of things. That I wanted to be a film director, artist, rock star actress, playwright, and, and then I always said, well, if, if all of those fail, I'll, I'll be a cartoonist. So I <laughs> you know, continued with all of them. I think by the time I was 15, I dropped all the others and was just left with cartoons. So, I guess I should ask briefly about the... There's been discussion recently about a, a supposed sex discrepancy between cartoonists. And looking through an edition of Private Eye, it's, it's weighted more towards male cartoonists than female ones. Ah, um, yeah, but... And some of the some of the women don't make it obvious they're a woman, so people assume they're a yeah. man. So I discovered last night uh, Sarah Boyce. I assumed uh, she was a man because she just signs the cartoons Boyce. I was so right. excited to find out she's a woman. I instantly followed her on Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm going to... Well, I mean, hopefully she'll listen to this. I can tell her to write her name bigger and put Sarah in front of it. Are there particular scenes or environments that you come back to again and again when you're drawing? There are, yeah. There's um, the, the, the grumpy chap in an armchair with uh, his <laughs> wife and grown-up daughter in the doorway and they're, and they're saying something about him and I've used that one so many times. Um, <laughs> it's just a good format to kind of put a joke into. And, uh, and then uh, the obvious one, there's uh, somebody behind a desk with a computer saying something yeah. Earth shattering to the person on the other side, <laughs> and uh, or just oh, oh, people at a party. That's um, with the glass. You know, people c- talking at a yeah. party, and just put the the joke into there. But but again, it comes back to the fact that I don't really like drawing that much. So it's, 
that's quite quick. <laughs> I couldn't rattle off. That's you know. Actually, I could even use templates. I hadn't thought of that. So three oh, templates yeah. <laughs> just change the captions. Wouldn't have to do any drawing at all. Yippee! I mean, it's it's observational comedy continued by other means in a lot of these cartoons, isn't it? Because you're dealing yeah. with the the everyday, and also the the person, the man behind the desk, who's telling you something earth shattering, and it's normally told from the perspective or woman. Yes, yeah. I, I do I do try to uh, mix it up a bit. So it's men, women, women, men. Yeah. I, I, I've noticed sort of slightly lazy habit with a lot of cartoonists where they just put the woman in a traditional woman's role, and the, you know, and I try yeah. to not do that. You do a very nice line in um, Business Bastards. Oh, yes. Business Bastards. That, yeah, and th- they frequently are men. You know, it's the, it's the man in the pinstripe, pinstripe suit with a kind of malicious expression Actually, on his yes, face. Yeah, 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 I've just, yeah, to contradict myself, yes. Uh, it's, it's sometimes it needs to... <laughs> I, I personally just find it funny. The bastard business person is a man. Yeah. Obviously, you get bastard business people who are women, but in a, in a cartoon, it, I don't think... They're stereotypically as bastard business-like as men. So That's it, true. all those there's, fat there's cat a... cartoons that the editorial cartoonists do, they all, it's always men. Although there, I have just found a good example of you doing something completely different, which is a bastard businesswoman <gasps> who's standing in front of a group of miserable employees and she's pointing to a, a target <laughs> yeah. sheet with you know a steep vertical line on it and she's saying, this is how stressed we'd like you to be by Friday. Yes, that's OK, because she's more sort of uh, middle management, you see. She's, oh, I see, uh, she's, OK. <laughs> um, she's just letting you know what the, what the bastard business boss, who's a man, has, has decided. Griselda there. That's all for this edition of Page 94. We will be back again with another one soon. And in the intervening time, the magazine is available in all good news agents and quite a few bad ones as well. Thanks very much for listening. See you next time. Goodbye.